Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of Buffalo Plat. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. I am a professional historian of the American frontier. I'm the author of seven books, including my newest book, The Whiskey Rebellion, A Distilled History of an American Crisis. And I'm a historian of the American conservation movement. You can catch me every week on the INSP series, Into the Wild Frontier, also streaming now on platforms like Amazon Prime, NBC Peacock, and Fox Nation. Today on the program, we're going to be discussing vintage hunters rather than vintage hunting. And that's something I really wanted to do with this program. I wanted to talk about the great hunters of history. Now, if you want to find information about the great long hunters of the 18th century, like Daniel Boone or Simon Kenton, there's a lot of that out there. Uh, if you want to talk about the great hunters of the 19th century, like Davy Crockett and Jim Beckworth and some of the great mountain men of the 1800s, there's a lot out there. But there isn't a lot available on the great hunters of the 20th century. And the person we're talking about today, Colonel Townsend Whalen, in my opinion, ranks right up there with all of the great hunters of that 100-year period, and for my money is probably the greatest of the first half of the 20th century. So we're going to talk about Townsend Whalen, his history, his legacy, the things he leaves behind for us over a series of episodes here on Buffalo Plaid. And what I want to do with the first one is really talk about Whalen's family history, uh, his own personal background, kind of the rags to riches story, if you would, quite the opposite, in fact, um, going from a well-to-do uh, Philadelphia gentryman to really one of the great survivalists uh, and soldiers of the, of the 20th century. So Townsend Whalen um, comes to the outdoors in a very unusual way. Um, he's born in 1877 into a very emerging, wealthy, prosperous Philadelphia. He is the son of a wealthy doctor. His mother is one of these old money families in Pennsylvania. Uh, and like a lot of children raised in that sort of environment, his life was kind of laid out for him. He was going to probably go into the family business of some kind. He really didn't struggle. Um, he never needed to be very active. He wasn't very physically fit. Uh, he would often say that he was, quote, tall, but thin and weak, end quote, as a child. Uh, and I think, you know, that's kind of one of the compelling elements of this story is that Townsend Whalen, for all he's going to be, uh, starts out in a, in a pretty unimpressive fashion from, from a physical perspective. He will say that despite his um, sort of silver spoon upbringing, uh, early on, I seem to have formed a desire to wander off by myself into the unfrequented country. Um, and we're going to see that in a very big way. At the age of 11, Townsend Whalen's father, kind of wanting his son to challenge himself to get outside, is going to buy him an air rifle. And that air rifle will very quickly turn into a 22 caliber rifle. Uh, and this will set him on his journey, uh, if you would, into the wilderness. Um, but things really changed for Townsend Whalen, whose friends called him Townie at the time, uh, whenever he was 15. Because when he was in 15 years old, uh, a major celebrity in the physical fitness world visited his corner of Philadelphia. And that man was the famed bodybuilder and strongman Eugene Sandow. Now, when Whalen, at 15 years old, saw Sandow, uh, like I think a lot of young boys his age, he saw something he wanted to be. Big, strong, rippling muscles, charismatic. Uh, and that really flipped a switch in, in Townsend Whalen's life to challenge himself uh, at a physical level. And this was really the moment for him that he will leave behind his sheltered life and begin this amazing journey that will ultimately secure his legacy. Whalen will write, after seeing Eugene Sandow, something seemed to crack inside me. I determined I would start regular exercise, build myself up, and make something of my life. 
In just one year, he puts on 30 pounds, and he'll later write, The results were perfectly marvelous almost from the start. I have kept up daily exercise every day of my life since. My physical training, more than anything else, is responsible for any small success that I've had in life. We'll see Whalen become addicted to achievement, addicted to winning, and this will take him to joining the Pennsylvania National Guard. He joins in the context of the Spanish-American War. Now, if you're not familiar with the Spanish-American War, it was a war began in 1898 uh, as an invasion of Cuba under the pretenses of helping the Cuban rebels, the revolutionaries, fight off the, the terrible Spanish Empire, much in the same way that we fought off uh, the British Empire in the 1770s and 1780s. That's the way it was sold. But it very quickly turned into a very, uh, I think, sort of uh, American-centered land grab in a lot of ways. America will get a lot of territory out of that war, including uh, Puerto Rico, Guantanamo Bay base in Cuba, the Philippines, uh, Guam, all these sort of former uh, long-lost elements of the Spanish Empire. Anyway, for Townsend Whalen, like a lot of young men, he wants this to be the time to prove himself. Uh, the issue is the Spanish-American War ends pretty quickly, uh, and he never actually gets to see combat. In fact, he doesn't even get to leave Pennsylvania. Um, so this is going to sort of make up Whalen's mind for him in a way. This is the life he wants. It's an opportunity to serve that he missed, uh, and he sort of sharks aside his debutante lifestyle of Philadelphia's social elite to pursue life as a soldier. Now, he's not content to do this in the Pennsylvania National Guard. He wants to see the world, and he will uh, apply to become a commissioned officer in the United States Army shortly after. The issue is, there is no traditional ROTC methodology available that we have today to do this, and Whalen will have to take a test. Now, to take a test, um, this comes around on a yearly basis. He misses the deadline to apply. And for Whalen, what he's faced with here at the end of the Spanish-American War is that he can either A, sit around and wait for a year, maybe exercise, certainly challenge himself, or B, find some other avenue for the next 365 days so he can later take the, uh, the entrance exam to become a commissioned officer. And this is when we see, again, another one of these amazing turning points in his life. Because Townsend Whalen will choose to go on a, what we describe as a long hunt of sorts, a modern long hunt, even by the context of the early 1900s. And he goes to the place that's called by many to be the final frontier uh, of North America. Uh, and that's going to be British Columbia in Canada. Now, because of my work with INSP and Fox Nation, I've spent a lot of time in the Rocky Mountains over the last few years. Um, much like Whalen, I am a Pennsylvania man. Um, you can say I sort of um, uh, have been attracted to the, to the outdoors my whole life, much like him. Um, there is nowhere in the world more spectacular than the Rocky Mountains, uh, especially modern British Columbia. Uh, and that's what's going to bring Townsend Whalen to this place. Sweeping vistas, thousands upon thousands of miles of virtually unexplored wilderness, at least in his mind, uh, and endless opportunity. He's going to go on a hunt. He wants to test himself in the outdoors, and he wants to challenge himself. Uh, and when he shows up in British Columbia, he doesn't have much, and that's by design. Townsend Whalen will write, in British Columbia, he, quote, gathered a little outfit which consisted of a 40-72 Winchester rifle, a 30-30 Winchester, Winchester Model 94, the necessary ammunition, a light tarp, 8 by 11 feet, which I made, a pair of army blankets and a poncho, a set of nested camp kettles and practically nothing else. This is a man who can afford a lot of luxuries that most people can't. 
But Townsend Whalen is intentionally going into one of the harshest wilderness with virtually nothing but uh, two rifles and a hunting pack. Because again, he's seeking the challenge. He's, in my opinion, addicted to the thrill. He's never been to this area. He has no experience here. Um, but I think that was part of it. And as he approaches a small town called Lillooet, British Columbia, he's going to meet a man who had all kinds of experiences. And this is a relationship that will be uh, nothing short of transformative for him. The man he meets is a prospector named Bones Andrews. Think about that name. Holy cow. Talk about a man from another time, Bones Andrews. And Bones Andrews lives, again, in Lillooet. It's a small town along the Fraser River. Um, and Andrews is everything that Townsend Whalen really kind of wants to be. You know, Bones Andrews is a man living in the early 1900s, but I always think of Bones Andrews as kind of the last, the last relic, the last gasp of the old mountain man. Right? We have this image of these old mountain man trappers going west, um, looking for beaver furs and dealing with native peoples and trading. And, and really by this point, of course, that is gone. But Bones Andrews is a prospector. Uh, he's looking for gold. And that's kind of the new venue of the mountain man, if you would. But make no mistake, Bones Andrews knows how to survive in the wilderness, and he will absolutely be able to help Townsend Whalen on his journey to, to embracing that new lifestyle. Before Bones and Whalen take off into the wilderness, uh, Whalen will describe them as partners to hunt, prospect, and trap in the wild regions where there was no civilization. Bones Andrews gives Whalen a couple pointers that really only an experienced mountain man would have. And one of them was to purchase what's something called a free minor certificate uh, before venturing off on the hunt. If Whalen had just gone hunting, he would have been subject to regulations, right? Seasons, bag limits, these sorts of things. Um, no antler restrictions at the time, but, you know, we're very much on that path. Um, Andrews tells him, get a free minor certificate. Because what that means is it's a state-sanctioned hunt that never ends. Uh, if you're a minor, you have to quite literally hunt for food. Uh, and Bones Andrews will, will tell Whalen, if you have that certificate, uh, you have sort of unlimited access, if you would, uh, to game of all kinds. This is a period, it'll last a year, where, where Whalen really becomes one with the wilderness. Uh, they are in the forest for one year straight. Uh, there's virtually no respite to this. They, they move and they hunt and they camp where they sit. Uh, Whalen will learn to cook food over a campfire. Um, he'll learn to construct effective shelters. Uh, he'll learn how to make some pretty nutritious and sustainable foods out of simply a pot and a kettle. Um, and because Whalen is educated and experienced, uh, he really uh, becomes a student of the game. Basic Woodsmanship 101 uh, to the extreme. Bones Andrews teaches him how to hunt. He teaches them how to track. He teaches them how to, uh, to, to clean game, how to preserve meat. And again, Whalen is not just the kind of person that wants to learn it, but he wants to remember it. So he's jotting all this down and writing it down. And, and these stories will later in life become fodder for some of the great outdoor books, history books, and guidebooks of the 20th century. Townsend Whalen will write over nine glorious months Bones taught me the way of the mountains as only those of the Old West knew it. He was very much soaking in all of this. And I think it's, it's curious that Townsend Whalen references those of the Old West. Because again, the mountain man era is now gone by about 50 years. Uh, you could even maybe in some, take it up, maybe 40 years. Uh, but that's still looming large in Whalen's mind. He still really wants to become one of those people. When he does return to Philadelphia, he takes his examination to become a member of the officer corps of the United States Army. He comes in second place in his group, and he becomes a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. His father has these you know, very moneyed, important connections. They help him with that. 
There's even an old family story Whalen will tell that he meets President Theodore Roosevelt at the time. And he says that he wants to be part of the U.S. Army. Roosevelt supposedly says, uh, you are just the type of young man that I want to see in the Army. So here you have Whalen's kind of, you know, brush with, with greatness along the way. Immediately after joining the United States Army, Townsend Whalen sets himself apart as a great soldier, but a really superior marksman. Uh, with his service rifle, he's said to be able to hit a man-sized target at 200 yards, six times in 10 seconds. Uh, he was an extremely accurate shooter, but he was well-practiced. The thing about Whalen was, is he had this, this fascination, obsession um, with studying the mechanics of a firearm, how it operates, how it shoots, uh, how functional is it in the field. Um, you have to wonder about you know, the, the mental state of Townsend Whalen. Um, to be wealthy, to be moneyed, to have your whole life laid out before you and to give it up, right? To be so obsessed uh, with, with adventure uh, and with the minutia of combat uh, that you forsake all of that. But in 1915, his journey really begins when he's assigned to the 29th Infantry Regiment uh, in the deep jungles of Panama. Remember, we talked about the Spanish-American War kind of opening up America's imperial age. In just a short time, Guam, the Philippines, Wake Island, American Samoa, Hawaii, uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, parts of Cuba, and later the Panama Canal Zone will be taken by force by the United States government. And one of the ways that the American empire secures what it has uh, is by sending troops into the jungle. Townsend Whalen, the U.S. Army believes, is the man to do this. His group is not given combat duty. That really doesn't exist in the Panama Canal Zone. Um, but he's told to, quote, explore the extremely rough mountainous regions thickly covered with primitive rainforests. Uh, he's told to conduct a survey, right? The U.S. government wants to know what land is there, what land is available, and what land they believe now will belong to them. It's at this time that we see Townsend Whalen's and Sessions shift. Um, he was always a shooter. He was always somewhat obsessed with the mechanics of firearms and combat. But here is when he becomes a survivalist. Here is when he uses what the long-gone Bones Andrews will have taught him in the mountains of the Rockies in British Columbia, this time tested in a new way, in the thick, warm, hot, muggy, mosquito-infested rainforests of Panama. He's going to begin by trying to solve immediate problems in Panama. One of them is that they're being eaten alive by mosquitoes. And he devises a tent tarp-based system uh, that would allow his men to sleep comfortably, keep most of not only the mosquitoes, but also most of the rain out. Um, and again, he's going to write all this down. He's going to describe um, kind of what he's dealing with and what he's doing. Uh, and he's going to inadvertently, at least at this point, be laying the foundation for writing a guidebook on how to survive in the wild, and not just in any type of wild, but from British Columbia, the Rocky Mountains, to Panama. Uh, he's writing about how to survive in any number of, of places. Now, by the time World War I rolls around, and this is where we're going to conclude today's episode, uh, we see Townsend Whalen be sort of fully realized as an asset to the United States Army. Um, he certainly would have been a great combat leader, there's no question. But the Army views him as uh, someone that is better suited to train young soldiers, right? His, his wealth of knowledge, his resources, the Army feels are best suited domestically, are best suited at home, um, teaching young men how to get ready for war. And that's going to be incredibly important because World War I is right around the corner. So Townsend Whalen will never be combat tested, but he will be battle tested throughout his life. 
Uh, and it is in this realm as a teacher, as a trainer, as an instructor, that I think the great legacy of Townsend Whalen uh, is, is sort of left behind for us today. So that's the end of part one of this series. I do want to obviously continue in the future with part two. We'll talk about Townsend Whalen's life after combat, life after active duty in the, in the wilderness as a soldier. And we'll talk about uh, the tools and tactics and innovations that he develops, which affect us today in the modern world. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next time on Buffalo Plaid.